Welcome to the lecture on envelope relative precision envelopes. Now we will focus on the urine formation. So let's have a typical terrestrial vertebrate nephron. This looks a little different than in the regular textbook. So it's an amphibian nephron, but it's same also in the snakes, in the lizards, and etc. So on these ectothermic. So there are only two parts. There is proximal tubule and then there is a distal tubule. And between them there is a only short intermediate segment. So not this long loo that we have learned in the school books. So the blood is filtered here in the Bowman capsule and then this filter is moving there. So this, this uh, filtered urine and then in different parts you can regulate what will remain there when it's collected in the collecting duct to to form the uh, end product. So the nephron in the amphibians it's, it's uh, pretty long, it's one centimeter and it starts with pumping sodium. So you need ATP so you are using active transportation. So you are using energy and with that, then there is a chloride channels, so the chloride can can pass passively, and when you are increase, uh, moving these from the primary urine, then the remaining will be hypoosmotic, so the water is moving also, and. Together, this uh, can, although it's it's only one uh, half of half of this size, so it's twenty or forty percent of the sodium chloride and water uptake is taken already in this beginning section. And not only those, but also we have sodium glucose co-transporter. We have sodium amino acid co-transporters, etc. So we can take different other important molecules back from this urine. And then, of course, we have this last section that, okay, in there we are taking the ions away. And with that we can regulate the water excretion and how much, also well, how much ions we are secreting. And in the real life, this nephron looks like a mess. So we have the proximal convolved tubule and what we can see in this inner section that there are some uh, microvilli. And Therefore, we are using a lot of absorption in these cells. And it goes there quite low to the intermediate segment, after which we are starting the perkele. Welcome to the lecture on Envarta Testudo Animals. Now we will focus on the urine formation and how we regulate it in different vertebrates. So this is a general nephron structure of a vertebrate. It's not looking the same as in the textbooks. But it's an amphibian and the same structure is also in the lizards, in the snakes, etc. So there are only two parts. 
there is the proximal tubule and there is the distal tubule. And between them, there is this intermediate segment, so very short segment, not this long loop that we have learned from the school books. And so we have the blood flowing in the Bowman's capsule, and from there we can get the filtered. So there's water and small molecules. And we'll, it will go through the proximal tubule, it will go through the intermediate tubule, and then to the distal tubule. And from there, it will be collect, uh, going in the collecting duct to be excreted. And during this process, we can uptake different things at different times. Okay, it's about one centimeter long, and it will start with the sodium pump. So we are using ATP. to use, uh, pump sodium with the active transportation away from this uh, urine. And this will cause that also chloride wants to go away. And so we can use the chloride channels. And with this, okay, we are taking sodium and chloride away from the urine, that will cause that, okay, it's becoming hyperosmotic. And therefore, we are also getting the water away from it. So actually, with these mechanisms, we can take about 30% of sodium chloride and water away from the urine already in this uh, proximal tubule. And not only this, but we're also taking glucose together with sodium. We are taking amino acids together with the sodium. So we can do, we can, uh, do it much better than just regulating the uh, sodium and chloride, but we are taking all these important molecules back. And then in this distal tubule, it's, it's more on the ion regulation. So we, and if we take ions away, then we are regulating that, okay, now we are excreting only water. Or then, depending on, on, the, uh, on, on the conditions, that, okay, we can all even increase the uptake of water also. And over here we have the real st uh, structure of uh, uh, amphibian nephron. It looks like a mess. So there's the proximal convolute tubule. And you can see that, okay, the urine is going downward. And these wall structures, you have, can see these black spikes, they are microwillies. And uh, therefore, this area is needed for all kind of material absorption. And after this intermediate segment, we are getting on the early distal convoluted tubule, so it goes even deeper, but after that it will go back, up, uh, upward and to these late distal convoluted tubules. So what you can see that, okay, no microvillies. So it's used for some other purpose there. And how it works. So here we have the osmotic pressure to compare it with, with this uh, osmotic pressure in the blood, and then the chloride concentration. And of course, in the Bowman capsule, when we are secreting the water and small molecules, the osmotic pressure is m much the same as in the, in, the, in the blood, as well as the chloride concentration. And now we are uptaking sodium, 
chloride, but also water. Therefore, this uh, chloride concentration remains pretty much the same as well as the osmotic pressure because we are taking as much water away from the urine than chloride. So therefore the remaining will stay, stay pretty constant. So it's actually urine is isoosmotic. And then in the distal tubule now we are taking only sodium and chloride, but not water. So therefore this osmotic pressure is decreasing. So causing that now it's hyperosmotic urea. It's much only water there that is remaining. And how we can then regulate that, okay, it's, it's, it's just releasing poor water or not. So when we don't have antidiuretic hormone, then we are taking sodium and chloride away in the uh, in the distal tube but because there are no aquaporins so so there is no pathway for water so therefore the water reabsorption is limited and this is a good way so now we can excrete the extra water pretty easy but the problem is that okay at the same time when we are not taking the water away, it might be that it's, it's producing high plasma solute concentration. It doesn't matter if we are getting the water sources, and, and of course the amphibians are t t getting them easily. Um, so we can maintain the high plasma co uh, solute concentration, but it's not good in all con uh, conditions. So therefore, we can have this antidiuretic hormone. So now there is more water channels. So water is passing away. But it's only passing away with limited efficiency. So this it's more, never more concentrated than the blood. So therefore this urine versus plasma osmotic pressure is never above one. And if we are taking the water back, then this plasma solute concentration is unchanged because we are now taking sodium, chloride, or, or, or all these small stuff, and then the water. And this antidiuretic hormone is can, can be also used that, okay, now you are excreting things and then you are taking everything back. So it could be also good that if you're using the antidiuretic hormone to close down these nephrons. So you are affecting on the number of active nephrons. We were discussing this in the earlier videos that, okay, we have in the Bowman capsule from to there we have the blood vessels and the blood. And if we close this blood vessel, then this nephron is out of order. And therefore you are not filtering, you don't have to recycle it in the, in the kidneys. But that's not very typical because for me, us, because we are the mammals. But in all non-mammalian terrestrial vertebrates, this happens. Okay, over here we have the mammalian kidney structure that is uh, familiar with for you. So there's the cortex. And over there we have these glomerules.
so these Bobman capsules. And in the middle, we can see that there are some lines. So we can get the, these loops. And then we have the renal pelvis, to which we are collecting the urine. And on the other end, we will get the ureter. So then we can get the uh, get, uh, get rid of the urine. And this is the schoolbook version of the nephron. So we have the Bowman capsule, and the third we can get the blood, and it will be filtered. And from there, the uh, we have the urine in this uh, proximal convoluted tubule, which is going in line with capillaries. So when we have now this urine there, we can then collect different things already in the beginning of this nephron. But then in this mammalian schoolbook, uh, we have this descending limb of the handle, and we have thick segment, and then we have the thin segment. And the important thing is that this thin segment is going toward the center of the, of the kidney in the medulla, but it's not always going very deep. So we might have also short lobes that are uh, turning already on this outer metal. Or then we can have these long lobes that are going in the, as, as, as deep as possible. And the interesting thing, or important thing, is also that we have these vasa recta. So we have the circulation around this uh, handle loop. So we can then get different things away from the urine at different time, and they can be collected with these, uh, uh, these blood vessels. And then, in this uh, ascending limb, we have the thick segment also, that is used for different purposes than these thick, thin segments, and actually, this is rotating there, near the Bowman capsule. So there is this uh, juxta glomerular apparatus, so mecula densa. So there are certain uh, cells there that are getting the information to okay, how concentrated is the urine and how concentrated is, is the, the uh, blood. And then there's the renin secretion. So we are regulating with one hormone there. And after that, we are getting it on the uh, distal convoluted tubule and again, we can move different ions, etc., from the urine. And after that, we are getting it in the con conducting top duct and all the way in the renal pelvis and then to excrete it. Okay, but the interesting part in this course is that not only how it works, but how it works differently in different kinds of animals. So we have these different layers. We have the cortex, we have the middle, and then we have the renal pelvis and renal papal. And there is a lot of variation how deep this papil is going there before forming the renal pelvis. And in this microscope slide, you can see that there are these holes. So these are the, uh, there are the, these uh, endings of the handle loop, and they can go as deep as possible in this uh, uh, 
Renal medulla. And then there is this uh, extension, so this it's uh, this papill forming. And depending on different animals and what in what kind of environment they are living, then the size of this renal pebble is variating. So in these aquatic species, no renal pebble at all. But then on these arid, so in the dry environments, they have highly developed. So now the length is much larger in the animals that are living in dry areas. And then it might be that it's having a little bit differences in the insectivores versus the rodents or other mammals, etc. But anyway, this is the general idea that, okay, the kidneys have different uh, outlook. And how thick is this a uh, medal that affects that okay how what is the maximal length of your hand link hand loop so then you can have it longer and deeper there in the in the center and these animals with a thicker medal they seem to be they they have more concentrated urine so if the medal is uh, very thin then the uh, osmotic concentration, uh, osmotic pressure is, is, is low, but it will rise quite drastically. But what we can see over here, that in some cases it's not always the same. So there's species dependent variation. And this is partly, at least, related that, okay, if you have a larger animal or smaller animal, then of course the kidney structure might be a little bit different. First of all, the relative thickness is decreasing when you have a larger animal, but it's decreasing much uh, faster in these aquatic species than these arid species that are living in dry. And if we look on the one kilogram size animals, this difference is about tenfold. So that means that, okay, uh, you have much larger medulla in those animals that are living in dry environments. And over here, we can see the real uh, uh, real kidneys. So in the laboratory rat, not very uh, good in this, uh, it's not living in, in any desert, etc. So the medulla is not so very long. So the uh, these handle loops are, are rotating quite early but then in these animals that are uh, living in in the desert they have a little bit different structures so they they might have longer loops and therefore they might get more water back and in the sand trap there in the in the in the uh, lower part is a very typical example that okay it's a actually going almost out from the kidney it's have very long loop nerve thank you